Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston and welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. On the brief today, Tom Orlick from Washington on the latest economic data and also the latest on U.S.-China trade talks. Also with us, Greg Farrell on President Trump's growing list of subpoena disputes in the federal courts. Let's start with Tom. So there were these data out on the consumer confidence down a little bit, but still relatively high historically. Yeah, that's right. So we've got uh, consumer confidence for November coming in at 125.5, uh, uh, down a fraction from uh, just above 1.126 uh, in, uh, in October. Um, so that's a bit of a surprise. Uh, U.S. unemployment is very low. Uh, markets are buoyant. Uh, there's optimism about, about the prospects for a trade deal. Um, so the markets were looking for uh, a stable or even slightly stronger consumer confidence reading. Um, that said, David, uh, that the, the, the number for November is a number which remains very high um, in historical comparison. Uh, the consumer is not falling off a cliff. Uh, and that's important because as we look into 2020, it's the consumer which is going to be doing the legwork in driving U.S. growth. So, Tom, you're our chief economist here, so let me put you on the uh, spot, because it seems like different data come in different directions. We also had new housing starts that looked encouraging, pretty good. We had University of Michigan, I think, consumer was pretty high. It seems like it's sort of up and down. Can you really get a clear picture of where the U.S. economy is right now? So our view, David, um, is that we are looking at a slowdown, but certainly not a meltdown. Um, and the key way to look at this uh, is through the lens of the job data. Uh, a year ago, uh, even at the beginning of 2019, uh, we were looking at a U.S. economy creating a very solid 200,000 uh, new jobs a month. Here we are at the end of 2019. Uh, the run rate has come down considerably. We're closer to 100,000 than 200,000 now. Um, but that's still enough job creation to keep unemployment at a near 50-year low, to keep wage growth at a very solid 3% uh, or even a little bit higher. Um, and with that unemployment rate and that pace of wage growth, we're looking at robust consumption. Uh, and for 2020, fourth quarter of 2019 and into 2020, yes, we're looking at a slowdown in growth. Uh, but recession fears, remember those recession fears everyone was talking about a few, even a few months ago on the back of the inverted yield curve, those re recession fears are looking increasingly overdone. So uh, you, as so many economists tell us, really it's all about the U.S. consumer right now is keeping this economy going as strongly as it is. Put that together with the U.S.-China trade developments. We heard they're at least talking on the telephone this morning. I think the chief, uh, the, uh, the U.S. trade representative, uh, Robert Lighthizer, with Lou Her were talking on the telephone. Uh, how dependent is the U.S. consumer on what goes on in those telephone conversations? Um, so there's clearly a, there's clearly a relationship, um, but for both China and the U.S., um, we're talking about continental economies. We're talking about economies where the bulk of the action is domestic, uh, and that's especially true uh, for the United States. Um, so yes, if we had more tariffs, if we had exports weakening, that would certainly be bad news for the U.S. manufacturing sector. There'd be some pass through to the jobs data. There'd be some pass through to consumption. Um, but trade is not the dominant factor um, moving U.S. labor markets. Uh, I think the more direct relationship right now, the more immediate pass through is going to be to confidence and to markets. Uh, we've had markets returning to record highs, touching fresh highs, um, as the U.S. administration, from Donald Trump down, stoke hopes of a trade deal. Um, <laughs> if we get that deal, markets are going to stay high, confidence is going to stay buoyant. If for some reason something breaks down, and of course that's happened multiple times in the past, that's going to be bad news for markets. We'd expect the pass through to confidence uh, and then to the real economy. Okay, Tom, so good to have you on. Thank you very much. So Tom Orlick reporting from Washington. He is the chief economist with Bloomberg Economics. And now we go to Greg Farrell right here in New York for some law stuff. <laughs> Let's talk about the, all these now subpoena lawsuits that are going. We had a, yet another one yesterday, Don McGahn, the former White House counsel, and the district court said, uh, what are you thinking, that you can keep him from appearing, Mr. President? You don't have that authority. Absolutely. It was unequivocal from the district judge. Uh, but, of course, now that's going to be uh, appealed. It doesn't mean that McGahn necessarily has to testify right now. 
but it, it's yet another in a series of losses of this kind for the Trump administration. However, by following, you know, rigidly to the process, he's able to kick the can down the road and weeks or months will go by. Well, another pr uh, proceeding that you and I have been following here is the Cy Vance proceeding. The, yes. the uh, district attorney here in New York is pursu pursuing some tax records yes. held by the accountant of President Trump. That's now up in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took action yesterday saying, okay, you don't give over the records yet, but we want you to get your briefs in right away. Yes, quickly. So accelerated briefing uh, on the local case. And I don't think we'll have to wait for June on that. The briefings, I think, are scheduled over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it should be much more timely than the normal process with the Supreme Court. In the meantime, we have Rudy Giuliani. You wrote a piece yesterday, actually, about Rudy Giuliani. What was going on in Ukraine? It turns out he had a lot going on in Ukraine. Some yes. of the personal, maybe some of the professional. Uh, yes, for a guy who has said that he has only one client, and that's uh, President Donald Trump, he does seem to have a lot of irons in the fire. Um, and we reported yesterday that he uh, almost got involved in a case against a Ukrainian billionaire named Kolomoisky, who is not well known except that he has believed to have close ties to the new president. Exactly. The guy who is the uh, subject of a pressure campaign about uh, political investigation. So uh, Rudy seems to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, have a very busy travel schedule and a lot of people he talks to around the world. Well, and at least some reports that perhaps he might have been representing to Mr. Kolomoyska and also another uh, very wealthy Ukrainian, that maybe he could help him with a little bit of the problems they were having with the Department of Justice. Um, certainly in the case of Dmitry Firtash, yes. Uh, and we wrote about that a month ago, that uh, Firtash had had some indirect relationship with Giuliani that seemed to be an attempt to make his case go away. Um, on the other hand, Kolomoisky, I think uh, Giuliani seemed to be having talks about the side that was against him. Um, so, yes, he's playing several different sides of the Ukrainian oligarch game. Thank goodness you're keeping this all straight, because I certainly couldn't. Okay, many thanks to Greg Farrell of Bloomberg News. And now it's time to find out how the markets are reacting to today's top stories. Joining us now is Abigail Doolittle. Well, it looks green to me right now as I look at it. It is green, but a little bit of a snooze fest, really small moves at this point. But we do have record highs, that's worth noting. And I thought it was pretty interesting what Tom Orlick said in terms of it being a slowdown, but not a meltdown. It reminds me of the earnings season that we're coming out of right now. Uh, better than feared, people thinking it's going to get better. And that's good enough for investors right now to just keep this slow melt up going so long as nothing really bad happens it seems as though we are in this cruise control of stocks going higher although I will point out we once again have bonds rallying over the last 11 sessions bonds up nine of those 11 days so it tells you some investors are a little bit concerned okay that's the question I must say I have with almost this entire year yes. how can the stock market keep going up and bonds have actually been holding up pretty well normally you expect an inverse relationship and not so much this year yeah you're right about that so what we're looking at probably Probably for the first six to nine months of the year, the expectation that the Fed was going to lower rates, that happened, so that really helped out stocks. But now that we have the Fed on pause, but we have yields going back lower, it's a little bit of a conundrum. It suggests that maybe some investors think that there is going to be some sort of an actual more of a slowdown where the Fed may have to start lowering more to somehow uh, bring in some accommodation. Maybe that repo window stays open. But it suggests the liquidity you were talking about yesterday uh, could gain even more. But it's something to keep an eye on. When you have two asset classes diverging, there's something's got to give. They will come back together at some well, point exactly. to make sense. Some people say one has to give. Either the yes. bond market's right or the stock market's right. They yes. can't both, both be right. And most will say that the bond investors are smarter than yeah. the stock investors. I used to be an equity person, so maybe I take a little <laughs> bit of a pardon or offense to that. But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, because right now we do have that divergence happening. Okay, thanks so much to Abigail Doolittle. And now we're going to turn to Mark Crumpton. He's here for Bloomberg First Word News. Mark? David, U.S. senators are saying they'll work fast to punish Turkey over testing a Russian air defense system. Lawmakers are considering proposals that would sanction the NATO ally, both for the missile system and for the offensive in northern Syria. The sanctions could include an asset freeze, limits on credit, and visa restrictions. Thousands of Palestinian protesters took part in a day of rage across the occupied West Bank today. Some groups clashed with Israeli forces in Ramallah to protest the U.S. announcement that it no longer believes Israeli settlements violate international law. They burned Israeli and U.S. flags as well as posters of President Trump. Demonstrators also held signs saying that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu should be sent to prison. He was indicted on corruption charges last week. Former Chilean President Michelle Bachelet says that she has put together a United Nations team to examine allegations of police abuse in the country. It looks like 
they, uh, there has been uh, certain difficulties with the protocols if we look at the damages, the eye lesions, etc. But I will wait until my team will come uh, back uh, and gave a full report so we can really do what we need to do, is to do the report, but mainly do recommendations. Chile's government has come under stark criticism for its police tactics. Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam didn't make any new concessions in her first comments since pro-democracy forces won local elections over the weekend by a landslide. Speaking to reporters, Lam did acknowledge the vote reflected, quote, unhappiness with the current government and called for peaceful discussions. The priority for us now is to properly follow up on actions proposed, including community dialogue. After these five or six months, Hong Kong people have realized very clearly that Hong Kong can no longer tolerate this chaotic situation. Everybody wants to go back to their normal life, and this requires the concerted efforts of every one of us. Lamb's comments reiterate the plan she outlined more than two months ago, one protesters have already rejected. She also said she has, quote, not been held accountable by Beijing for the outcome of the elections. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. Coming up, a tale of presidents and kings. A federal district court draws the distinction and rules former White House counsel Don McGahn must testify to Congress. Our panel takes us through the ramifications. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. A federal district court in Washington ruled yet late yesterday that former White House counsel Doug McGahn cannot be excused from testifying before Congress simply because the president doesn't want him to. In the words of Judge Catania Brown Jackson, presidents are not kings. This means that they do not have subjects bound by loyalty or blood whose destiny they are entitled to control. Welcome now from Washington, Joel Payne. He's former senior aide to Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and from Burlington, Vermont, E. O'Brien Murray, a Republican strategist and president of Accountable New York. So, e, uh, O.B., I'm going to start with you. Isn't the judge George, David, right? Isn't you? the judge right? President Trump thinks he's a king? Well, I think the gentleman who sits in this chair often, Bernie Sanders, would say that what the judge said was absolutely correct. I, of course, sitting here today, I'm not going to agree with Bernie Sanders on any of that kind of stuff. But uh, the reality is that yeah, people need to go testify, but in the rest of that uh, uh, decision by the judge, he said they don't have to answer all the questions. Yes, they have to appear, but then once there, they can invoke various privileges and so forth. So that's fine. That's all part of what this democracy is about. It's checks and balances. We go from the legislature right on back down to the ju judiciary, judicial branch, and we go from there, and we keep this process moving. But remember, that was also not even with the current hearings. That was not with the investigation that's going on now for impeachment. That was a ruling made all from the Mueller uh, investigation going way back. So we'll see where that goes from this point forward. So and, John, and, and Bolton has his own one going, his own case going. Well, exactly. And Bolton's lawyer today, I think, said that it just didn't necessarily apply to Mr. Bolton. But, Joel, let's turn to you, you here. What's the president's uh, real goal? Because it seems pretty clear the courts are basically going to enforce subpoenas. They always have, including as President Nixon. Is this a stall tactic? Well, the goal is to delay and delay and delay as for as long as he can, and eventually to just not cooperate. Um, I think the president's strategy and the White House strategy is to try to invalidate the investigation by starving it of resources. And a part of that is uh, making sure that people like Don McGahn and John Bolton don't testify. Um, I think the politics here for the president do get tricky when it comes to what is he trying to hide. If Republicans' point here is that this is a witch hunt and there's nothing there, um, you know, what is the argument for continuing to obfuscate and not allow people who have material uh, material information like Don McGahn, like John Bolton, from from, uh, you know, participating um, in, you know, a, a above board reasonable investigation. I think the, the White House and I think Republicans are going to start to run out of options for how to explain that away. 
Okay, uh, Obi, let's, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Above board, reasonable, uh, above board reasonable investigations would make sense. Right now you're talking about executive privilege. You're also talking about a, a partisan investigation, a partisan attack on democracy, a pardon attacks on this, on this presidency, and that's flat out true. It's a partisan attack. This is not bipartisan. Yeah, well, there's almost nothing in Washington these days. It doesn't feel pretty partisan, but let's talk about what effect this might have on the election in 2020. Let's put aside for the moment, if we can, the impeachment. Most people think they know where it's going to end up. We may be wrong. Let's talk about the, the election. Is this inevitably having the effect of focusing the 2020 election more on foreign policy, given the involvement in Ukraine, than otherwise would be the case? Obi, Obi what do you think? I, I don't see it coming back to foreign policy uh, long term. Short term, of course, that's all part of it. But at the end of the day, right now, with the economy where it is, we're, we're really talking about a pocketbook election again. I think when you look at the last election, as I said on air before, the unfavorables of both candidates was so surmountable, it was so hot, so much more intense than before, pardon me, that what you're going to have this time around is, again, the same thing, potentially. Many of the candidates have high unfavorables on the Democratic side. As that continues, they'll come back to pocketbook issues and they'll overlook the unfavorables. So, so Joel, do you agree with that, that this is not enough to focus more than is typically done on foreign policy? And more important, perhaps, is does the former Vice President Joe Biden agree with you? Because he is running ads right now in Iowa, as I understand it, that really go pretty much to the foreign policy commander-in-chief aspect. Listen to what, in part, he says. To be commander-in-chief, it's a sacred duty. The next president is going to face enormous challenges. We're going to need a leader who can, on day one, stand with our allies and have them know there'll be no question about the word of the next president of the United States. So, Joel, that doesn't sound to me like a pocketbook appeal. Uh, is the vice president on to something there? Well, that's Joe Biden's approach, and that's his path to victory, is the position this is a commander-in-chief test between he and Donald Trump. If he can get the election to be focused on that, I think Joe Biden's going to have a lot of success through the Democratic primary. But as you know, there have been a lot of other extraneous issues, uh, Medicare for all versus Obamacare expansion, um, you know, other pocketbook issues, that we, as we talked about, that have controlled the primary so far. Now, impeachment has started to impact the primary process, but that actually does not fully support Joe Biden. That actually harms Joe Biden because I think a lot of nervous Democrats think that President Trump will use the Ukraine issue and the issues related to Hunter Biden um, as a wedge uh, to potentially take votes away from Joe Biden and to characterize him the same way that he did Hillary Clinton three years ago. Obi, if we stop the whole, we stop the whole election right this moment, at this moment, who among all the candidates, President Donald Trump or all the Democrats, is being benefited from the impeachment? Oh, right now, Donald Trump, it's unifying his base, and it's taking any coverage around, away from all the Democrats. If you watched any of the news shows, you watched your show over time over this past week, what, what have you heard about? You've actually heard only about impeachment. You've heard about what's going on now on back of the districts. You've heard about Michael Bloomberg getting into this race. The oxygen is being sucked out of this race right now from all the Democrats by Bloomberg getting in. At the same time, with Joe Biden spending $3 million on that ad buy, you have Michael Bloomberg spending $30 million over over the entire country at this point in a week. Joe Biden last report had $9 million cash on hand, if I'm not mistaken. That number is going to, of I, course, I'd, be eaten I'd away at. Yeah, David, I'd respectfully disagree with that. I actually think that impeachment has been good for Democrats. If you look mm -hmm. at the latest poll numbers, it shows that 50 percent in the latest polling for Morning Council say that they support impeachment and removal of the president. Even good numbers for Republicans show that it's a plus five or six issue for Democrats. And so I think the president um, has really got his back up against the wall here. He's not the person that's benefiting. I think Joe Biden is compromised a bit, but I think overall Democrats feel good about how they've administered the impeachment hearings and what the what the public fallout from that is going to be. OB? The Democrats blew this. The Democrats blew this when Jerry Nadler was first covering the impeachment hearings and fell off, and they put on Adam Schiff. Now you even have a Democratic Congresswoman coming out and saying she may not even vote for impeachment. She thinks they got to figure out what to do and let the voters decide. When you, this vote originally passed for impeachment with all the Democrats only minus two. Now the question is how many can you bring to the party to get the vote going? The voters are tired of impeachment. I think that's what's really wearing on the voters. Democratic primary voters, I can see them moving on. Beyond that, I don't see it. Okay. I haven't had a chance to meet my friend OB, but I think respectfully, I think okay. voters are tired of the president well, doing impeachable things. Well, let's fix that part of it at least. Let's get the two of you together on room. That would be fun. Okay. Thanks for the our panel. Love to do it. Joel Payne and E. O'Brien Murray. And a disclaimer, Michael Bloomberg is the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News.
Still ahead, Dick's Sporting Goods took a stand on guns and expected to pay a price. But it looks like that price has been paid in full and now it's surging back. It's our stock of the hour next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour. Dick's Sporting Goods is heading for its best day since May of 2018, jumping more than 20 percent. The quarter report showing little negative impact from its retreat on gun sales. And Kaylee Lines is here with the Dick's Sporting Goods story, and it looks pretty good right now. It was very good. This was a beat and raise quarter. The raise was actually the third time they've raised their full year earnings guidance for the year. They now raised about 15 cents on the high end. Thanks, earnings per share will go as high as three dollars um, and sixty cents. And the third quarter really blew it out of the water. Earnings came in at 52 cents. That handily beat the analyst expectation, which was about 38 cents on average. And comp sales rose 6%. That was uh, much more than the street was looking for. They only expected them to rise 3.4%. And actually, the second quarter that we've seen growth, remember, Dix was coming off what had been six consecutive quarters of comp sales decline. So you're really seeing that rebound continue. And interesting, that was driven both by higher traffic and more transactions, higher ticket prices. So people not only are coming into the stores, they are spending more. And they're seeing growth across all of their major categories that includes hardline you know golf clubs kayaks and as well as apparel and footwear but as you say it's a big turnaround from it where is. they were I mean as you know we talked to Ed Stack the CEO after the last quarter and he we talked about the fact that they took a really pretty aggressive stance on guns and they expected to get hit but they thought they'd turn it around this is what he said we thought it would cost us about a quarter of a billion in sales just about what it cost us and now we've anniversary that we've made some changes in our store taking uh, repositioning some uh, uh, square footage we took hunt out of 10 stores last fourth quarter took out of another 125 stores uh, this spring as a test to see what it would be like without hunt and uh, our last quarter comps were up three percent we raised our earnings guidance so it's pretty good so you can see they were raising their earnings again. That was 3% same store. Yeah. Now you're talking about 6%. And they really did reconfigure their stores and said, not so much, Hunt. Let's do some other things like clothing and things that we can make more money off of. It. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. It goes to show you it matters much more what they now offer than what they aren't offering. Because even though they've pulled guns out of 17% of their nationwide footprint, essentially, the fact that they have a better uh, reorganized offering of things that are selling really well, like apparel and footwear, uh, means that they are able to offset those declines. And it seems they've also maybe turned around on sentiment as well, because remember when they initially made this decision back now, almost two years ago, there was a lot of blowback as regard to the Second Amendment yeah. issue of it, but it seems that traffic no longer is a concern. And it wasn't the sales of the guns, it was sort of a boycott. It was saying right. we're not going to go buy anything there, no matter right. what it is. Yeah, okay, Kaylin Lines, thank you so much. Great report on Dick's Sporting Goods. Up next, you've heard about the national security and humanitarian issues at stake on the U.S.-Mexico border, but what about the economic impact? We talk with an expert on cross-border deals with our southern neighbor. That's coming up on Ballots of Power, on Bloomberg Television, and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, a judge has ordered former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify to a House committee. The panel's investigating possible presidential obstruction. Mr. Trump claims McGahn is covered by presidential immunity. The Justice Department plans to appeal the ruling. Irish Finance Minister Pascal Donahoe says any speculation about a reunified Ireland is premature. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg News today, he said even after Brexit, the country has a long way to go. I think we're many, many uh, uh, phases away from something like that happening. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement is very clear uh, that uh, there would have to be a uh, possibility of a agreement being reached to, to then trigger a border poll. A border poll is what then looks at the future status of Northern Ireland and whether it is part of a broader Ireland. The view of the Irish government is that the timing is not right for a poll like that, that in fact it would be very counterproductive. Donahoe also told Bloomberg he believes an agreement currently in place between the European Union and the UK to prevent a hard border in Ireland is proving effective. Turns out that Mexico had a slight recession in the first half of the year. The economy shrank one-tenth of one percent from the end of 2018 through the second quarter. For the year, analysts say Mexico's GDP will grow the least since 2009. 
The problems include low oil output, slumping construction, and stalled services activity. Democratic presidential candidate Senator Elizabeth Warren is looking into allegations of bias against women who applied for an Apple credit card. She and Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown wrote to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau asking for information on how the agency is monitoring the lending practices of Goldman Sachs, the underwriter of the card. Both Goldman and Apple were hit with criticism after prominent Silicon Valley executives complained earlier this month. They said they received significantly higher limits on their Apple credit cards than their wives, despite having similar incomes and credit scores. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. President Trump has made a priority of securing the U.S. southern border with Mexico. And there's been a raging debate in Washington about how to address the national security and the humanitarian issues raised. But there is also a substantial economic impact of the administration's actions along the border. Welcome now Mike McGinnis of Jones Day. Mr. McGinnis has spent 20 years on cross-border mergers and acquisitions involving Mexican and other Latin American companies after serving as in-house general counsel for GE Sensing and Inspection Technologies Unit. Welcome. Good to have you here, Mike. It's good to be here, David. So let's go straight at the economic effects. Right. We just heard a report that Mexico, we know, is struggling right. and slipped into recession. How much of the difficulty Mexico is having is because of the problems along the border? Yeah, so so I, I think exactly that that's exactly the point. The humanitarian crisis is something that we hear about on a daily basis. Uh, but, but people are not really talking about the looming business crisis that's underlining that. And I think that business crisis is partially driven by the conversations around the threats of a border closure or tariffs of up to 25 percent on Mexican exports. I think those things which are designed to achieve a political objective are creating a lot of business uncertainty, which is having a rippling effect through Mexico. So there's a lot of trade across that border, both ways, uh, U.S. and Mexico. Yeah. How much of the effects that we're seeing are because of an actual curtailing of trade? How much of it is the uncertainty that you refer to? That people say, uh, we're still trading, but we're not sure if we can keep trading. Yeah, so, so I, I, was, uh, I was down in Mexico uh, during the last threat of tariffs. Uh, uh, I think it was a 25, up to 25 percent tariff on all Mexican exports in the, in, in the context of discussions around immigration. And I remember uh, I was at dinner with a, a number of business executives who told me that they were literally lighting candles in prayer. Um, so so the, the, idea that a tw the idea of a 25 percent tariff is really, a, or closing the border themselves, is really quite destructive. I think you have to kind of understand the region to get a full sense of the impact. So the, the border, right, the border runs across four U.S. states, right? Two U.S. states, uh, which are the largest economies in the United States, one U.S. state, which is the, one of the largest economies in, in the world, California. You also have six Mexican states, one of which is the largest economy in, in Mexico as well, Nuevo Laredo, uh, sorry, Nuevo, Nuevo Leon. And in that region, you have 14 million people. And it's the busiest, most frequently crossed border in the world. So you have to put this in the context of $1.7 billion of product that cross that border every day. 20,000 trucks, more than 200,000 cars, more than 500,000 pedestrians on any given day is cr are crossing that border. And when you look in that $1.7 billion worth of goods, what do you find? You find the things that Americans consume on their table. Or Mexican produce keeps us going during the winter. You find the auto parts that sustain the U.S. auto industry. You find the electronic supplies, which are going to be so popular and sold on this black on this Black Friday that's that's coming up. So I think it really is a very a very deeply integrated. Uh, region in zone. We're talking with Mike McGinnis of Jones Day. This is all about trade back and forth. You right. specialize in investment, mergers and acquisitions right. across the border. What has happened there? Has that dried up because people are saying we're just not sure what the rules are going to be? Right. So I, the traditional wisdom in, in, in the M&A world is that M&A thrives on certainty. Uh, certainty from a valuation point of view in the market, certainty from a political point of view and a regulatory point of view. And right now what we're seeing is a large amount of uncertainty in Mexico. If you put, the, if you put in context the sort of unfriendly attitude from the north that the Mexican businesses are experiencing. Then you put in that in the context of a new presidential administration, which sometimes has anti-business rhetoric. You'll, you'll, you'll see Mexican executives being sandwiched between a northern and southern pressure, which is creating a lot of uncertainty in their world. And it's having a real palpable effect on, on the M&A market. So just to give you a, a granular number, uh, in the first half of 2019, there were 78 M&A deals uh, for a value of $5 billion. 
Contrast that to last year, it's a 35% dip. Mm -hmm. Contrast it to two years ago, it's a 50% dip. And is that ingoing or outgoing from the United States point of view? Is it more U.S. companies investing in Mexican companies or the reverse? It's actually, it's, it's, it's more U.S. going in. And in fact, the cross-border M&A statistics are quite dismal in terms of going out from Mexico to the United States. I think we had something like 50 transactions in the run-up to the, the last two years and just two transactions in the first half of 2019 from Mexico to the United States. We're talking with Mike McGinnis of Jones Day. You mentioned Amazon. AMLO, the new president, and right. he has said some things that some of the business community has been nervous about, I think it's fair right. to say. You also have Pemex, right. a, a major driver of the Mexican economy with some difficulties in the oil production area as well as the price of oil. Uh, how can you sort out, if you can, what's going on with the uncertainty about the border and effects right. on the Mexican economy and the U.S. economy uh, along the border from the new regime and, yeah. and, and Pemex? Um, well, well I, def I definitely think it's, a, I think they're in a cycle to begin with. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, a, there's uncertainty that's driving a slowdown in the business. I think that the Mexican businesses have, have, had to be, have had been confronted by these tariffs and have had to look at different opportunities and different markets to where they're going to trade in the event mm -hmm. that there actually is a large tariff put on the border. I think all that combination of things and, and the business cycle has brought Mexico into recession. So, so yeah. Mike, is this entirely separate from USMC and NAFTA and the uncertainty about that? Because yeah. we also have that, particularly with the auto industry, for example. Right. I guess that would bring some certainty exactly into what the world's are. But are you, what you're talking about, just the border security issues by themselves? No, I think I, when, when we think about what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border, when we think about trade across that border, I think we really need to think about it in the context of the U.S. economy as well. Mm -hmm. And when I think about it in the context of the U.S. economy, I think about it through the prism of the U.S. auto industry and the U.S. electronics industry. And just to give you kind of a sense of that, if you look at what, how the U.S. auto industry works, it operates on lean manufacturing. Principles use just-in-time delivery of components and spare parts, so they depend on things that cross the border from Canada and from, and from Mexico. Put in the context of that, that 16% of the auto parts that are used in the, in the U.S. auto industry come from Mexico. And then think about a 25% tariff or the closure of the border and the ripple effect that will have uh, We're talking on those businesses. Mike McGinnis of Jones Day here. Uh, a final question. We hear a lot about the wall. It's all about the wall, the speed of the wall. The fact is an awful lot of the trade doesn't go around a wall. It goes through the regular border crossings, right? right. Uh, yeah. From a point of view of certainty, would we be better off with just say, okay, go ahead and build the wall and right. then get back to regular trade negotiations? Yeah, no, I mean, I think the tra trade passes through, it obviously it arrives on trucks and right. cars right. and it passes through sort of the typical international lane. It's not part of things that are passing over or under or around the wall. So yes, I agree. I think, I think, I think fostering an economic trade environment is the most important thing in terms of building certainty, and then that certainty will drive economic results both in Mexico and the United States. It's a really helpful perspective. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us. Really good to have you here. Great That's Mike here. McGinnis. He's a partner at Jones Day. Coming up, President Trump today signed an executive order to address the pressing problem of the disappearance of Native Americans. We talked with the governor of one of the state's most effective, and that's Mike Dunleaver, Republican of Alaska. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There is a pressing problem in the United States of America with the disappearance of Native Americans, particularly women, with a 2008 study saying that women in some tribal communities are 10 times more likely to be murdered than the national average. President Trump today signed an executive order to address this crisis. And for more now, we welcome Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy for today's Conversation in Chief, joining us today from Anchorage. Mr. Governor, thank you so much for joining us. And I particularly bring you in on this subject because you have a lot of Native Americans up in Alaska. This is a problem for you in your state. We, we do. 15% uh, of our population is Alaska Native. I think it's the highest percentage of any state in the country. And um, we, we, too, have the issue of missing Native women. And this, is, this has been an ongoing problem, so I do applaud and commend uh, the administration for, for putting this on uh, the, uh, the, the front burner as opposed to the back burner. We look forward to working with the Trump administration on this, and I think uh, sharing data um, and, and, and putting more resources into this issue I think is going to make a difference. We do have a number of missing individuals up here in the state of Alaska. The last, uh, this last year under my administration, we've solved a couple cold cases that have been decades old. And um, again, I think sharing data amongst the, uh, amongst the states and, and with the federal government, I think is going to make a huge difference in solving a number of these cases. And Governor, how much of it is a problem at the initial stage, at least, of just figuring out how many there are? Because I've read some places that not all of them get reported up. 
Um, there, there's certainly, uh, we certainly need to update the, uh, the database. We certainly need to uh, uh, figure out and categorize, uh, are these folks that are missing because they may have um, uh, uh, had an accident out in the rural part of the state of Alaska, fallen through the ice, or, or, or disappeared on a snowmobile ride in the wintertime? Uh, or are some of these folks, um, especially the younger uh, individuals, are they being trafficked? Uh, have they actually left the state? So I think looking at uh, the different uh, possibilities as to what has happened to these individuals, I think is going to help us a lot in solving these cases. But uh, again, the data is going to be real important, and the cooperation and collaboration between entities and states and the federal government is going to be crucial in solving these issues. So, Governor Duncan Levy, uh, another thing that you've really spent a lot of your time on as governor is addressing the economic health of Alaska. It's been under a little bit of stress because of the decline in oil prices, which really has hurt your budget. Explain to you us where you are in that process? So Alaska is an oil state. We used to be the oil state in the country. In 1989, we were producing 2 million barrels of oil per day. Today, it's about 500,000 barrels of, uh, of oil per day. Uh, and with the drop uh, of oil, in oil price, this has really impacted our revenue stream in the state of Alaska. So we've had to reduce the budget here the past year uh, dramatically, about $600 million. We have about a $1.6 billion gap in our budget. We've closed it about 40%. Um, this was a difficult year in terms of closing that uh, gap. And um, so as we, as we look into the future, we're trying to diversify our economy. Alaska, once again, has been really just solely, uh, solely based upon its oil production and gas. We're trying to bring in as many investors as possible. We're trying to take advantage of our proximity on the globe. Uh, I had mentioned before that we're the closest state to Asia by thousands of miles. We're about nine hours to every industrialized place in the face of the earth in the northern hemisphere by plane. We have the second busiest uh, cargo airport in the country and the fifth busiest cargo airport in the world. Alaska has a lot to offer. We're, as I say to people, we're American and so much more. We have American law. Uh, America Jew jurisprudence, but we also are like an emerging economy. Um, we're a resource-based state with, with what I think uh, is tremendous opportunity and upside for investors. We're talking with Alaskan Governor Mike Dunleavy. Uh, and Mr. Governor, when you look at the, uh, the opportunities for Alaska in terms of investment, what is the low-hanging fruit or what are the most likely targets of the sorts of sectors that you can get to come up to Alaska? Well, certainly mining, certainly oil and gas. Our uh, tourist industry is, is really growing by leaps and bounds. And um, we're hopeful that we can stand up a timber industry once again in the state of Alaska. We have about one-seventh of the country's timber. Right now, for all intents and purposes, we really don't have a robust timber industry. So these are some real opportunities. But also transportation, uh, again, uh, out of our uh, international airport, the Ted Stevens International Airport, but also the fact that we can, uh, we can transport resources from other parts of the country and Canada as well out of our ports uh, in the state of Alaska. We have more coastline than the entire United States put together. And again, our proximity to Asia, I think, positions Alaska really well going in the future, not just for resource development, not just for our growing tourism, uh, tourism sector, but also transportation. Uh, Governor, often in business, it, it, you have to spend money in order to make money. You have to invest in order to really get the returns. How does it for Alaska, is there infrastructure you need to build or investments you need to make for Alaska to attract that investment and ultimately make more money? Well, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're a new state, relatively speaking. We came into the union in 1959. Um, and certainly the, uh, the drop in oil has impacted our ability to uh, uh, build uh, infrastructure in the state of Alaska. Our capital budgets have been smaller than in years past. And so this is a discussion we need to have this year with Alaskans and our legislature as to how much money we're going to dedicate towards our operating fund how much money we're going to dedicate towards our capital fund because, again, it's capital that's going to build the roads, the bridges, the ports, the airports, which is going to help with developing more of our resources and help support our uh, resource industries, our, our, our tourism industries, our fishing industries, et cetera. So we certainly have to have that discussion because we are falling behind in terms of building Alaska. When you took on the task of balancing that budget up in Alaska, you had, I think it's fair to say, some difficulty with some parts of the legislature. They didn't necessarily agree with everything you wanted to do. How is that going now? Can they be a partner for you in this new effort to diversify the economy? Absolutely. Um, you know, there was a, it was a difficult session last year, obviously, because when you cut hundreds of millions of dollars from a budget, you're impacting people. And I understand that this caused a lot of consternation across the state of Alaska. 
Um, but in terms of working with the legislature, we have a lot more in common than uh, what divides us. Uh, our, our desire to build Alaska, our desire to create jobs, create wealth for Alaskans, there's no doubt about it. So I'm looking forward to working with the legislature. Uh, again, on building Alaska, solving this fiscal issue, and bringing more industries and uh, um, more investment to the state of Alaska. So I think this is a, I think this is going to be a year that I hope Alaska turns the corner on its fiscal issues, but also on, um, again, the opportunities for more investment in the state of Alaska. And, and finally, Governor, can you compete on regulation or the lack of regulation? I mean, it, let's give a specific example. You've said that you want to be the first state that really complies with the Supreme Court decision, saying you can't require people to pay money to a union. Is that going to help you with investment? Um, it, it, it may. I mean, that particular issue was more about freedom of association, freedom of, uh, of speech, obviously. And so we, we certainly want to comply with Supreme Court rulings. But um, in terms of regulation, we've identified about 115 regulations that we're looking at taking off the books that are impeding business in Alaska and also uh, the daily lives of Alaskans. So we're continually looking at how we do things, our permitting processes, our regulatory processes, to make sure that we can compete with other states. And um, I think we're heading in the right direction. I think our economic indicators uh, uh, demonstrate that as well. Okay, many thanks, Governor. Really appreciate you being with us. That's Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy joining us today from Anchorage. Coming up here from Fannie and Freddie to Goldman and Apple. We've got the latest on the intersection of Wall Street and Washington. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television, and we are on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have been a bit of a political hot potato since they were put into conservatorship back in 2008, something that was supposed to be temporary. Here for an update is Jesse Westbrook, who covers financial regulation for Bloomberg in Washington. So, Jesse, I've been watching this now for 11 years. They keep saying they're going to come out. Are they on their way out? Steve Mnuchin says he has a plan. Well, I think the Trump administration certainly wants them out. Look, look, David, I mean, this is perhaps one of the most binary trades that you can you can sort of assess in, in Washington these days if you're if you're in the financial sector. I think if Trump wins re-election, you should go long Fannie and Freddie. If uh, if you think Trump is not going to win re-election, you should short Fannie and Freddie because even the timeline that that the Trump admitted that the Treasury has laid out, his regulators have laid out, you're really not going to see an IPO uh, of their shares until 2021 at the earliest. That's obviously would carry into a second administration or perhaps a Democratic administration. Right. And if it's a Democratic administration, all bets are off. I mean, a Democratic president, can, if, particularly with the progressive, you know, creep that's 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 that the direction the way the party's going, they have a total different vision for these companies. I mean, you know, Elizabeth Warren might be content keeping them as a sort of government utility for the rest of eternity. So, so very, very, very binary trade. So, Jesse, you said the magic word, Elizabeth Warren, maybe two words, Elizabeth Warren, because she's in the news on another financial regulatory issue, and that has to do with the Apple card and Goldman Sachs. She and Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, have written evidently to the CFPB saying, you better pay attention to what they're doing over there. They might be discriminating against women. Yeah, shocker that uh, Elizabeth Warren is is beating up a Trump-appointed CFPB uh, director and Goldman Sachs in the same day. Um, I think we're all quite surprised by that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, so the, the issue here is the Goldman had this algorithm with this Apple card that gave some uh, some some applicants a some female applicants a much smaller credit limit than their husbands, and and some in Silicon Valley were quite upset about that. Goldman's been beat up a lot about it. And this is right in Elizabeth Warren's wheelhouse. I mean, what a few issues would be more in her wheelhouse than than Goldman not giving women the, the same preferential treatment that it's giving men who are applying for this card. So she's curious whether the CFPB, which is now led by a, a Mick Mulvaney ally, uh, Kathy Craninger, is doing anything about this, this Goldman controversy. We have not heard much from the CFPB on it, no evidence that they're doing much about it. So Warren wants to follow up and, and make sure they're taking a look at it. Yeah, it feels like it should be a fairly straightforward issue. Actually, as you know, New York state authorities are looking into it as well. And Goldman said, look, we have certain rules. Take a look at our rules. We actually don't even ask people whether they're male or female when they apply for the card. So I wonder whether how much of this is really, we think there's something there you got to figure out, or this is putting it to the Trump administration. We don't think you believe in the CFPB and you're not having them do anything. 
Well, probably all of the above. I mean, this Goldman thing is a bit narrow. It, I'm not, I'm not going to admit it and say it's unimportant. But there's a bigger question here about as, as, as financial companies become more like tech companies and we use things like algorithm to algorithms to make financial decisions, I mean, that could right. potentially work much better than what we do now, but there are obviously pitfalls as well. Yeah, and they could be a black box, and that's, that's always a little threatening. Okay, many thanks to Jesse Westbrook down in Washington. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. We're looking at a new threat facing the World Trade Organization. We're going to talk with Rufus Yerkes, who used to work there. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.